1 Corinthians chapter 2 will be our first spot we'll look at tonight. Uh, so we've been talking about Christian nationalism. This will be, I think we're going to wrap it up with this one. I might do one more, but um, I think we have gotten the point. I don't want to labor it too long, but I do want to look at uh, our, uh, our founding fathers of America. And I'd like to see, I'd like us to see, I'd like us to do a little deep dive and see if they actually were Christian men or not. Conservative news, patriotic Christianity, uh, Christian historians. Uh, we did a lot on New Apostolic Reformation. They all will say these same seven words. America was founded as a Christian nation. So I want to know, was it really founded as a Christian nation? Um, because there's a lot, a lot of people saying that we need to create well, what has been created is patriotic Christianity. Um, I love my country, but my country isn't my savior of my soul. And I'm of the persuasion that I don't really think people care so much that our founding fathers were Christian. I think people more care about, they can just use that to be able to get the church more actively involved in politics, is my opinion on the matter. Now, I might be wrong in that, but that's kind of the way I lean. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, we'll start there. 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians chapter number 2, we'll look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Which things also we speak, not in the words of which man's wisdom teacheth. We always have to be on guard on that. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We have to always do that. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So if, you're not, if someone's not saved, they can't understand spiritual truth. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now you believe that verse? I believe it. We all believe that verse. So we're going to run through some historical facts here. All the way back in January of 1776, Thomas Paine penned Common Sense. Those of you young people probably learned that through your schooling. And in that Common Sense pamphlet, he wrote about a government that was supposed to be by the people. And he wrote about a government that's supposed to be free from the rule of Great Britain. As a matter of fact, Thomas Paine was the one who used the phrase free and independent states of America rather than British America, right? He used that phrase. And he paved the way for the Declaration of Independence, which was written six months later. The American Revolutionary War, all historians would agree, it was won not just through George Washington's military might and not through just Washington's leadership skills, but also because of Paine, Thomas Paine's philosophy. They say it was the pen of Paine and the sword of Washington. You've heard that, I'm sure, at some point, um, that, that, that uh, won that war. But after that war was over, Paine published The Age of Reason. And The Age of Reason was 100% anti-biblical. Matter of fact, he is quoted as writing, When I see throughout the greater part of the Bible scarcely anything but a history of the grossest vices. This was a man who was deeply ingrained in the Declaration of Independence and influenced a lot of the Founding Fathers. He is quoted as writing in the Age of Reason. You can look this up and do a deeper dive for yourself a collection of the most contemptible tales. Now, does that sound like a Christian man to you? No. Not to me. Thomas Paine, he hated the gospel and he contended wholeheartedly against the gospel. He called it, and I quote, the fable of Jesus Christ. Wow. That's his words. And he refers to the virgin birth as blasphemously obscene and the belief of this is called faith? You can look it up for yourself. It's in the age of reason. Why? 
Why did he say things like this? Because he believed that reason was to govern like a god. And so when he read the Bible, if it didn't seem reasonable, he rejected it. That is why he said what he said about the virgin birth, because that doesn't seem reasonable. He worshipped the idol of intellect. He is quoted as saying, my own mind is my church. He is quoted as saying, the Bible was the word of a demon, not the word of God. So when you have so-called Christian historians that try to regurgitate the same seven words to you, America was founded as a Christian nation, it doesn't seem like Thomas Paine was a Christian man to me. Paine was a deist, and he believed in a God, but not the God of the Bible. Um, go to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John 4. First John chapter 4. It's one of the reasons Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence. It says, we hold these truths to be, fill in the blank, self-evident. You know why? Because truth must be self-evident in the minds of men. First John chapter 4, verse number 3. Bible says, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. That sounds like a spirit of Antichrist to me if someone takes that position. Christian historians try to sell the fact that Paine, before he died, repented of his anti-Christian views. Well, everybody goes through a cycle of life and they come to a point where they change their views. But Benjamin Franklin, who was a famous Freemason, and Benjamin Franklin was a very close friend of Thomas Paine, he actually helped him come to America. He wrote letters, many letters back and forth between those two men. And Paine held fast in every one of those letters in his unbelief. And it's recorded shortly before Paine died, um, people would go to him because they knew what he believed. Uh, Christian people would go to him and they, and they told him, if you don't repent and believe in Christ, you'll be damned. But in his last will and testament, he wrote, and I quote, there are no prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. So this is a man who was extremely influential in our founding fathers. And if we were founded as a Christian nation, then why did God send Thomas Paine, who sounds like to me, 1 John 4, he's got the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, go to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verse number 8. The warning is, in Colossians 2, verse number 8, the warning is this, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Another warning, we constantly have to beware of what is being told to us. We'll circle back to Benjamin Franklin. He was a signer of the Declaration of, the, of Independence and also the Constitution. Uh, not only did he discover electricity, but he was a faithful, lodge-attending Freemason. He was the master of the Masonic Lodge in Philadelphia, and he was also part of the Hellfire Club in England, which is if you really want to depress yourself, do some research on that. But Masons believe that good deeds get them to heaven. Um... Their good deeds, by the way, are represented in their Masonic apron that they wear. Have you ever seen this of pictures? Well, they have this apron, the Masonic apron. It's, it's reflecting their good deeds. It's reflecting their covering is their good deeds. Does that sound familiar back in Genesis 3? They made an apron and God said that's not a sufficient covering. 
The Freemasons are anti-Jesus Christ, anti-gospel. Benjamin Franklin rejected imputed righteousness and he rejected being justified by faith. He was quoted as saying this, not my words, his word. Original sin was as ridiculous as imputed righteousness. Doesn't sound like a Christian man to me. Sounds like for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. All right, go to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> I am thankful that I have been born in America. I am thankful for the freedom that we have in America. I am thankful to be an American. I am. I am thankful for all the men and women that have served, those that have shed their blood for us to be free, to be able to meet and worship God like we are right now. I am thankful for that. Amen. That doesn't mean we should just take what people say to us and just believe it like we're just supposed to believe it. We have to research on our own and actually see if these men were indeed Christian. They weren't Christian men. From my study and from my research, I'm not able to come to that conclusion. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 5. Another warning. Um, where's form of godliness? Am I in the wrong chapter? Is it? Is it? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5? Oh, it is. Okay. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. There's always a form of godliness. So Christian historians and those that want to espouse the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation will define religion differently because the founding fathers are often quoted as using the word religion quite a lot. So they'll take a piece of a quote kind of like I just did. I took a piece of a quote. And they do the same thing. They take a, just a, a snippet of a quote, and it, but it's separated from the full context. Re, the religion of the New Testament for the Founding Fathers was more about morality. They were moral men. It was about morality, not the deity of Christ. It wasn't about faith in Christ. It was about morality. And it was a religion was used as a general framework of just living a moral life. When they said religion, it didn't mean the gospel to them. So if you were to drum up all of these letters and read them all, you would come to that conclusion. And we need to be careful because George Washington, he was known, it was well known that he would walk out of church during communion service. He'd just get up and leave Martha there, and he'd leave. His pastor, James Abercrombie, he rebuked him for leaving during the Lord's Supper, and he thought a man of his influence was setting a poor example. So Washington just stopped coming the Sunday that the Lord's Supper was all the time. This is very well documented. Um, when, when someone asked George Washington's pastor at the time, Pastor Amber Crombie, he was asked about Washington turning his back on the Lord's Supper. Here's what Washington's pastor said. His answer was, Sir, Washington was a deist. He believed in a God. He just didn't believe and trust in the God of the Bible. He was a moral, upstanding man. And he conformed to the religious customs of society by going to church on Sunday. He was a moral man. He had great integrity. He was a man of great character. He went to church. He was a brilliant military man. He had excellent leadership abilities. He was a great president. I would vote for him. But to make him out to be like he was some type of great, born-again Christian man of faith, it's a far stretch. George Washington, our first president, it's historically known that he was a Freemason and his motto was deeds, not works. That's the motto of Freemasons. It's living a moral life, living a good life, believing in deity. That's what he believed. John Adams, who was our second president, he absolutely was a Unitarianism. Absolutely. Many of his letters, he completely rejected the idea of the Trinity. He called the Trinity, and I quote, 
a fabrication. He is quoted as saying this, There are what are called revolution principles. Principles of Aristotle and Plato. The principles of nature and eternal reason. To them, it was the age of reason. Intellect was the idol. In June, on June 28th of 1813, John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson. Here's what he wrote. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. So far, so good. In favor of these general principles in philosophy, religion, and government, I could fill sheets of quotations from Rousseau and Voltaire. Well, Voltaire wanted to end Christianity. <laughs> Voltaire, he was quoted as saying, Christianity is what infected the world. Christianity to them, or religion to them, was just morality. In December, on December 25th, 1813, he wrote to Jefferson, John Adams wrote, writes to Thomas Jefferson, and he says this, I believe they, referring to Rousseau and Voltaire, philosophers, he says, I believe they did more to propagate religious liberty than Calvin or Luther. That's his quotes. I disagree. <laughs> I'm sure you would. Under Adams' presidency, the Treaty of Tripoli was signed, and it was in that treaty, and you can look this up, there's a poster that was made out too. You can, you can see it. It says, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. That's what it said in the Treaty of Tripoli. But in order to get that passed, it had to be agreed upon by everybody in the Senate. <laughs> Where were all the Christians in the Senate that rose up and said, well, wait a minute, we've got to vote against this? They weren't there, folks. These were moral men, these were deists, but these were not born-again Christian men. The uh, John Adams, um, he was preached against in 1881. You say, how do you find this stuff out? I read and research, that's how I find it out. Pastor Bird Wilson, in 1881, he preached, I wish I was there, he preached a hot, fiery sermon. And in that sermon, he was quoted as saying, the founders of our nation were nearly all infidels. <laughs> that's, what the guy, that's what the guy said. I'm not saying that the guy, that's what he said. Philosophical reason is what influenced John Adams. Prophecies didn't matter to him. Miracles didn't matter to him. None of that mattered to him. The deity of Christ, virgin birth, none of that mattered. Mary couldn't have been a virgin in John Adams' mind because reason would say that can't happen. These men were unreasonable men <laughs> who put too much faith in intellect. Who was the third president of the United States? Thomas Jefferson was the third president. He drafted the Declaration of Independence. He didn't love the Bible. He denounced it, and he called it. He just encouraged unbelief. In January, on January 17th of 1825, Thomas Jefferson writes a letter to Alexander Smith. Alexander Smith is of the Virginia House of Representatives. And so he writes to him talking about the book of Revelation. And here's what Thomas Jefferson is quoted as writing. It is between 50 and 60 years since I read it, and I then considered it as merely the ravings of a maniac. That's, uh, we're just, I'm done. I'm done with believing somebody's a, a Christian when I hear that. I'm, I'm done. No more worthy nor capable of explanation than the incoherences of our own nightly dreams. Reason, the age of reason, a form of godliness. On October 31st of 1819, Thomas Jefferson writes to William Short. William Short was his private secretary, and he writes this. 
the greatest of all the reformers of the depraved religion of his own country was Jesus of Nazareth. That's blasphemy. Now that was the time when he was on a quest to put together what's called the Jefferson Bible. How many of you have heard of that Bible? You can research, research that online and find the Jefferson Bible. And the Jefferson Bible was all about the life of Jesus and the morals of Jesus, but not about the miracles and the deity of Jesus. He wasn't divine. All of the supernatural elements were erased. No resurrection and no ascension. It won't be there in the Jefferson Bible. Why? After all we said so far, what's the answer why? Reason. Because those things aren't reasonable. Intellectually, they don't make sense, so we have to move them out. As soon as you start messing with this book, there's going to be a problem. And that was the problem. They didn't believe this book. They didn't believe it. Thomas Jefferson denounces the Old Testament and the New Testament in many of his letters. Here's what he said in some of them. Some things were true, but were corrupted by inferior minds. He says this, Some passages are of so much ignorance, absurdity, untruth, and charlatanism. That's what, that's what Jefferson, our third president, said, who's supposed to be a founding father, uh, is supposed to be a Christian man as our founding father. I just don't buy it. He calls Paul the first corrupter of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Jimmy, I never heard this before. You, sure, you Look it up yourself. You can find all these letters, all this history. It's out there. It's all out there. They just don't tell it to our kids because they don't want them to know. Why don't they want them to know? Well, because it'd be really hard to sell them on the fact that you need to get involved in politics unless you tell a Christian, you know, our founding fathers are Christian, and here's what they did, and this is why you should do it. I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to vote. I have that freedom. God has given us and allowed us that freedom. I want to be a good steward of what God gave me. I'm going to go out and vote. And I'm going to vote for whoever is the most moral, unsaved person. <laughs> I think we should do that. And if somebody's saved, then they're great. I'll vote for them. I want to vote for the most conservative, moral candidate I can. Someone that lines up with as close to the Bible as we can get. That's who I want to vote for. We have that freedom to do it. But don't act like or tell people it's absolutely your Christian duty because then you would have to apply that truth to all Christians everywhere in every country under every type of government. And not all Christians have that opportunity. We do. So when it comes time to vote, get out and vote. It's a privilege that we have. It's not a spiritual requirement or duty. It is a privilege that we have. We should be good stewards of that privilege. And I, and I, and I believe that's right. On April 11th in 1823, Thomas Jefferson writes to John Adams and he says this, The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus and the virgin birth will be classed as a fable. The dawn of reason and freedom and freedom of thought would replace it. Or freedom thought, he says, would replace it. It doesn't sound like he wanted a Christian nation. It sounded like he wanted the gospel destroyed. If you're talking about a, a, a moral man, that can be debated as well. Jesus was God. There's no m mystical generations. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. All the miracles are true. All the prophecies are true. He died and He rose again three days and three nights later. He's divine. And just because your mind can't figure that out don't mean it's not true. It's true. 
And that is what makes someone a born-again Christian. You believe Christ as God. On April 13, 1820, he writes to William Short, again, his private secretary, and he says this, Jesus preaches the efficacy of repentance toward forgiveness of sin. I require counterpoise of good works to redeem it. That's his words. And he never, ever repented of those views. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's only through Jesus Christ where we have eternal life. Titus 3. Titus 3. <clears throat> Titus chapter number 3. Don't take my word for it. You can look all of this stuff up yourself. I tried to condense it just to give the basics so that we have a basic understanding of this. And I am not an historian. I'm a Bible preacher. But I'm trying to give you just the basics so that we can have a framework from which to work. And in Titus chapter 3, verse number 5, We've all used this when witnessing, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ is 100% the one and only Savior. Never, ever lose sight of that. Never that being justified by His grace, not by our reason, by the way, we should be made heirs according to the hope, not of the government, I've got no hope in the government, to the hope of eternal life. So that tells me our battle is 100% spiritual, not political. The church should not ever be, sent, be set up as a political organization. It's not a political organization. It's a spiritual one. It always has been and it always will be. We stand high and above any other principality or power on this earth. It's the most glorious organization to be a part of. The church of the living God. That's what we are a part of. And there's not, I don't care what Christian historian you want to put in front of me or what flyer they want to put in front of us in the mail or what email I get. I am not bringing that into the church. We are gospel-centered. We always have been. Baptists always will be. We believe the Bible and it's a spiritual battle. And I guess we are going to do another one, some Baptist history. I'm not a Baptist historian, but I know some men are, and we'll get just the basics so we can have a framework. But America is a Christian nation. I don't know. I don't know about that concerning our founding fathers. I will tell you this. I'll tell you about some Christians. In 1620, there were some Christians that came to America. They're called pilgrims. How about that? Pilgrims came to America in 1620. They were led by William Bradford, and they came to America with a Geneva Bible. That Geneva Bible came out of the same line of text as the King James Bible, same text. No corrupt manuscripts from Sinaiticus or Vaticanus, not in the Geneva Bible. They came led by William Bradford. They didn't bring the King James Bible because it was the Bible of the English king. That was the state of England that persecuted them. So that's why at that time, that's why they brought the Geneva Bible. These are the pilgrims. The pilgrims were not the Puritans. The pilgrims came over in 1620. They were a separatist people. Pilgrims were separatists. They left the Church of England 
because they wanted no part of the state church. So the pilgrims weren't trying to reform or change or purify the church from within. The pilgrims were Christian people who believed to come out from among them and be separate. So they left that church and they fled and they came in 1620. They were led by William Bradford and they came with a Bible. Those were Christians. You want to talk about the history of Christianity in America? Those pilgrims were Christians. Ten years later, in 1630, there's about a thousand Puritans that come to America. The Puritans were not separatists. The Puritans were non-separatists. Puritans, purify. They wanted to purify. They believed in purifying the church from within. That's the difference between the pilgrims and the Puritans. Well, in 1630, they came over under the leadership of of John Winthrop. And John Winthrop, he brought the first known copy. You check this out for yourself. It said that he brought the first known copy of the King James Bible to U.S. soil. Now that's pretty good. He preached a sermon titled, A Model of Christian Charity. And in that sermon, the Puritan John Winthrop He said this, stay committed to God and God will prosper you. Much, much different from what we heard from the founding fathers, isn't it? Now, rather than separating from the church, Puritans were non-separatists. They wanted to purify it from within, but they were Protestants. They protested what was wrong in the church, but they were Protestants from England And they didn't separate from the Church of England. Matter of fact, they had a charter from the King of England to establish a colony. So they landed in New England. And that's what the the Puritans did. They they were Christian people. They were born-again people, the Puritans and the Pilgrims. But the Puritans believed in reforming a church by just removing the non-biblical practices or the non-biblical traditions... And that's the main difference. One was a separatist group, one was a non-separatist group. So if you want to talk about America being founded as a Christian nation, we need to go back to 1620 with the Pilgrims and 1630 with the Puritans. You start talking about Thomas Paine and George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. These men were not Christian men. They were not. If you read just a little bit about their writings and their history, you really do your own research. You're going to find out our educational books and what they've been selling us is a bag of goods. They're cherry-picking things, and they're leaving a lot of truth, a lot of truth out. Um, I sat in one. I sat in one. I heard this Christian historian start to, to spew off stuff. And uh, I kept saying, I'm going to be quiet. I don't want to kill the meeting. I don't want to ruin the day. And my, I know my wife was praying the same thing, too. Like, don't, I know you're going to say something. I know you're going to say something. Well, somebody else asked a question. And I just couldn't help. It must have been the Holy Ghost came over me. And I had to. <laughs> couldn't have been my flesh. <laughs> so so I, I had to ask the question. And, of course, I lit the thing up. And then I, I, I gave him the pass because that guy's up there talking. I didn't want to have him die in front of everybody. It's not my place, not my meeting, not my... But I figured if he opened it up for questions and one guy took liberty, I was. But he tried to sell a bag of goods. It was just a lie. And one guy afterwards, he said to me, he goes, he said a lot, but he never answered your question. I said, that's because he knew the answer and he didn't want to give it to all us. And that was this. Give me one quote where Thomas Jefferson ever said that he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and he believed that Jesus Christ was virgin born. He gave us a long answer and he never gave us the answer because there isn't a quote. You won't find one. You can look long and hard. You won't find a quote of 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 any of those men adamantly saying Jesus Christ was 
the Son of God. Folks, that's the whole basis and tenet of Christianity. Last verse and we'll be done. John 3. John 3. John chapter 3, verse number 36. John 3, verse 36. Here's our message. It doesn't matter if someone's a government official or has a regular day job. It doesn't matter who they are. Here's our message. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You young kids, that's a good verse to memorize. We want people to believe on the Son, no matter who they are. 